In this video we will give an introduction to exam technique. The focus is on topics which come from introductory dynamics and control. <clears throat> so what's the basic layout of this video? We're going to walk through how you might tackle a typical question. And the key mechanism for students to engage with is you must begin by summarising clearly what you know about systems and control. Often the application of core knowledge to the question will be obvious and if you do this you will find solving the problem becomes much easier. So here's a summary. What you have to do is combine what you already know with the information provided. Once you've computed something new you can repeat this process, combine the new um, values that you've computed with other things that you already know and then you'll get some other information. Okay. So let's start by summarizing what do I already know or perhaps what should I know. You'll notice here I've emphasized that the following slides are intended to be illustrative. They're not going to cover everything but this is where I would start if I was doing an exam. So first order responses. I would expect people to know how to put a first order model into standard time constant form. You can see here with time constant t and gain, steady state gain c. I would expect them to know the standard step response for this starting from a non-zero initial condition. The decay rate clearly depends on the time constant t and you'll notice here if we look at this graph that that's one time constant that's two time constants, that's three time constants, so students should be aware of these types of shapes. You'll notice you get a 63% movement in one time constant, so what that's saying is from where I start to where I finish I will move 63% of the way in t seconds. And the steady state depends on Cu, so here's the steady state here. What about second order responses? They're not particularly relevant to this video, so I'll skip this slide. What about a summary of behaviour? So students should be familiar with diagrams like this, where you'll notice any poles in the right half plane are basically not allowed because that's divergent behaviour. If we're in the left half plane, you really don't want poles up here because they're too oscillatory. Um, you really don't want poles here because they're probably too slow. And where you're aiming for is this type of region over here. What about closed loop transfer functions? You should be confident in computing basic closed loop transfer functions. So here you can see the transfer function from target R to output Y. And I've also put in a box a sort of shortcut that might be useful at times. What about steady state offset? You should be familiar with this formula here for calculating the steady state offset for a target R and also if we want the steady state offset to be zero <coughs> you should notice that we need this criteria here which basically reduces to either G or M must include an integrator. Now let's go to a question so having summarized what we know now we start to look at the question. So what have we got? A heating system is initially at a steady state of 23 degrees with a heating input of 2 kilowatts. The response in temperature to a step change, and you notice it emphasizes this is an increase in the heating, of magnitude 3.2 kilowatts is given in the figure, and we'll show you that in a minute. Use this data to estimate a model for this process. So this is basically the first part of the question. Generally speaking, I wouldn't read the second part until I have done the first part. So we'll skip this bit for now and we're going to repeat this later on when we get to the relevant part of the slide. So beginning the question, the first thing I've got to do is say what do I know about heating systems? So you'll notice I've partially ignored the question but I've said the question's about heating systems so I must begin by saying what do I already know? So this is what I know that Typically, you can model a heating system with a first order model of this form. So you see it's a first order, it's got unknown coefficient b, coefficient c and coefficient k. 
it's got a temperature T, which appears here. It's got an external temperature, which I've called TE, and it's got a heating input U. So this is what I would expect students to know, and this is what you might call base knowledge, pass-fail knowledge. If you don't know this, then you are going to struggle. What also should I know? This model can be represented in time constant form. So you'll see all I've done here is rearrange it to put it in time constant form. So now alpha is the time constant, k is the steady state gain, and the key, another key point to notice here is this last phrase, the steady state temperature capital T is going to be Ku plus Te. So I've started by saying what do I know? Now that I've summarized what I know, next I go and look at the question again. So here's what I've got. The question told me that U moved from 2 kilowatts to 5.2 kilowatts. So there was a change, so if I put that here, there was a change in U of 3.2 kilowatts. So that's what the question has given me. I can also see from the figure there is a change in T of 8. So I can mark that here for you. There you can see the temperature has changed by 8. So therefore, what I can see straight away is that K times 3200 equals 8. So the change in heating, so the change in Ku, will give me the change in T. So what does that give me? That gives me K equals um, 8 over 3200. So we've got K. Now we also want the time constant but what we know is that one time constant okay, comes from basically a 63% movement. Now the movement is 8. We've already written that here. The movement is 8. So 0 0.63 times 8 is approximately 5. Now we're using a figure here so there's no point using lots of decimal places. It's not going to help. So where have I moved 5? Well if I moved 5 when I get to 28. So if I want to find a time constant I basically find the intercept with 28 and run down here and this will be capital T. So what you can see is that T is approximately 80. So I'm not trying to be more precise because it makes no sense with this figure. So on this particular um, slide, what have we worked out? We've worked out K, there it is, 8 over 3200, and we've worked out T. And those are the two unknown parameters in our model. So now let's read some of the information again. So this was the second part. The second part said, estimate the temperature of the surroundings, so the temperature surroundings, so that's TE, and hence determine and sketch the expected behavior if the surrounding temperature suddenly drops to minus 10. So that's basically saying if TE becomes minus 10. Assume one begins from a steady state temperature with a heating input of 5.2 kilowatts and this heating is retained. So we're beginning from the figure on the previous slide. So first of all, what do I know about first order responses and how can I exploit this? Well I know that at steady state T minus TE equals 0.0025U and what I've been given is that U equals 5,200. Okay? And I also know <coughs> that the steady state temperature is 31. Because if you go to the previous slide, you can see it settled at 31 when I had 5.2 kilowatts. So that's what I already know. Okay? That's the information I've been given. So all I need to do now is plug this in here and that will give me TE. So what I get is TE 
equals 0 0.0025 times 5,200 plus 31. So I, I've done that the wrong way. That should be a minus there. Minus 0 0.0025 times 5,200. Now, you'll probably notice the 0 0.25 tells you you're talking about a quarter. So you should be able to see straight away this is 31 minus 13, which is 18. You shouldn't really need a calculator for that. So we've now calculated TE. Now the next bit is to say what happens when TE, so we've got a question mark, what if TE basically goes from 18 to minus 10? So this is a drop of minus 28. So basically we're saying TE has changed by 28 degrees. And it's basically saying do the sketch. So where do you start? You start at 31, you drop by 28 degrees, where do we get? So. Let's go to the next slide to do this. And you'll see the first thing I've done is summarized my key information up here. I've got my start point, 31. I've got my end point, which is 3, so that's 31 minus 28. And I've got my time constant of 80. So if I put the time constants on, it's only a sketch, so don't lose sleep about it too much. So there's T, there's 2T, two and 240. There's 3t. So I know that after t, you get 63% movement. After 3t, you get 95% movement. And I also know that the total movement is 28. So let's put some values in. If we imagine this was naught, this was 5, this was 10, this was 15, this was 20, this was 25, this was 30. So where do we start? We start at 31, which is here. Now we know that the initial gradient reaches the steady state in one time constant. So if I draw my initial gradient, I get to the steady state. Oh, I've drawn that in the wrong place. That was very careless. That's what happens when you're doing this. First of all, I need to add the steady state, don't I, which is 3. So let's do that. There's the steady state, which is 3. So when I'm doing, I get to the steady state in one time constant, I need to get to that corner there. OK, so the initial gradient gets to the steady state in one time constant. But the actual value in one time constant is going to be 0 0.63 times 28. Now, I haven't worked out that value in advance, which perhaps I should have done, um, but this is going to be of the order of 18. If it's not exactly 18, don't worry about it. You can check that later. So that's going to tell you that you're going to be roughly here, okay, after one, one time constant. And 0 0.05 times 28 is going to be about. 1.5. So after three time constants, you're going to be about there. So all I need to do now is do a sketch which goes through those points and goes to the steady state. And now that's my job done. Now, if you want to see the working slightly more neatly, they are on these other slides, which I will put on the website. So you can check the numbers without my handwriting.